I'm Selma Schimmel, and we are at the 35th ESMO Congress in Milan, Italy, where we are having the opportunity to speak with physicians that come from all over Europe. And we are now joined by Dr. Hatim Azim, who comes to us from the Jules Bourdet Institute in Belgium, in Brussels, Belgium. Welcome. Thank you very much. And you're, you have a very interesting study that we're going to talk to you about, which has to do with breastfeeding and breast cancer, and that's all I know. Well, actually, this is uh, some sort of a continuation of a previous work we have done. So earlier we have uh, uh, examined the feasibility and safety of pregnancy in women with history of breast cancer. So a woman who has completed, a young woman who has breast cancer then completed her cancer therapy. Then the feasibility of safe and safety of getting pregnant. So this was a previous work. Then we went further to see whether it's, op it's safe and feasible for these women who got pregnant to breastfeed or not to breastfeed their, their babies. And backtracking a little bit, we have seen many success stories of women with histories of breast cancer delivering healthy, vital babies. Exactly, but it's always the concern of, even the medical concern of, of oncologists that maybe it's not entirely safe for this. Maybe pregnancy could stimulate breast cancer to come because back. Because of the estrogen. Exactly. So in our previous work, we have shown clearly that pregnancy is entirely safe. So it does not really affect the breast cancer outcome. Then we went further in this, I mean, in a previous study and now in this survey we have, we are presenting here in ESMO to see the feasibility and safety of breastfeeding. Now, if a woman has had radiation therapy, she's not going to be lactating necessarily or what happens to the radiated breast? So definitely this is one of the questions we were asking. So the uh, feasibility of breastfeeding from the previously irradiated breast. So whether uh, the milk production and whether it's what we found definitely that the irradiated breast does not really uh, grow normally during pregnancy, so the normal uh, enlargement of the breast during pregnancy, so it's, it's not really growing normally during pregnancy. And the milk production is pretty much compromised. But nevertheless, women w normally breastfed from the contralateral breast. Right. And if the, if, if the woman did produce milk and on a radiated, of irradiated breast, which I know was unlikely, but would that uh, be harmful to the baby? Not at all, but uh, definitely, actually this has been shown as well, so a minority of patients were able to breastfeed from the ipsilateral, from the same breast, okay? But uh, it's always a problem of how to place the baby on this breast, because usually the, the, uh, the positioning of the nipple, okay, is not normal, okay, because of the previous surgery, and mm -hmm. uh, so the baby finds it a little bit difficult to grab the nipple and, and undergo the normal breastfeeding. But for those who were successful in doing that, and actually this is pretty much, there's a very high role of lactation counseling in this area, so how to counsel, to provide professional lactation counseling for these breast cancer survivors on how to breastfeed, how to place their babies on their breasts. And I'm going to guess also much depends on where the tumor was and where the resection was. To a great extent, yes, of course. Yeah. So tell me some of the other components of the study that a woman now who's a survivor or who has a newborn or who is thinking of getting pregnant, anything you feel our viewers should know about? Well, certainly that a woman who had completed her breast cancer therapy there's no evidence that she, if she wants to get pregnant, there's no evidence that she, she should be denied this option. So she can go ahead and get pregnant. Uh, How long should she wait when she's completed treatment? Well, if, because we do have two big types of breast cancer. So those who are endocrine sensitive or hormonal sensitive and those who are hormonal insensitive. So hormonal sensitive, by definition, they receive hormonal therapy for classically five years, so she should complete the five years of therapy, mm -hmm. then afterwards she can get pregnant. Provided that, of course, there are no evidence that the disease is coming back before getting pregnant. For those who are not hormonal insensitive, so classically they receive chemotherapy, okay, mm -hmm. following surgery, and uh, this point is not very clear when exactly it's entirely safe, but conventional wisdom would advise a minimum of two years following completion of breast cancer therapy then to consider getting pregnant. This allows uh, that we have passed a, some sort of a critical period following diagnosis and also the chemotherapy have some sort of some side effects on the ovarian function so it allows the ovary to come back to its normal function. 
Afterwards, it's, it appears it's entirely safe to go ahead and get pregnant. And according to, this is our second survey we have, done, we have conducted in breast cancer survivors regarding the feasibility and safety of breastfeeding. And according to these surveys, they can as well consider breastfeeding. Are there any other components of the study we should be talking about? Something that's worth uh, emphasis is the uh, two things, actually. The first, that in our survey, we have found out that those women who did not breastfeed were mainly uh, advised by their doctors not to breastfeed. And this emphasizes the importance of proper counseling for these women. So medical oncologists usually have fears when it comes to a woman who had breast cancer to, to get pregnant and consequently to breastfeed. And this is, as you have early, earlier mentioned, the issue of maybe estrogen can play a role here and breast cancer coming back. In fact, this is a, con this is a perception rather than a, a, a stated fact, okay? In fact, pregnancy and breastfeeding is not all about estrogen. It's a very complicated interaction between different hormones. And in fact, high levels of estrogen are not always bad, okay? We, we currently, we use high doses of estrogen to treat breast cancer, actually. So it depends how, how much estrogen we are talking about here. So it's a, it's a perception rather than a fact that estrogen per se is always a bad thing for these women. And uh, so, so this fact that the medical oncologists or the treating physicians, they are the ones who usually promote it again as breastfeeding. This is something that is worth emphasizing on. And uh, I hope that these surveys can help us counsel the, uh, our patients in a, in, a, in a proper or a more, in a more proper manner. This is something. Another thing is the importance of lactation counseling. So these women are already faced with a lot of fears. So they have their own fears of, well, my breast cancer co might come back. They have their doctors that they are not always motivating this. The community that's maybe not as well pro for fear that breast cancer can come back mm -hmm. again. So she is faced, and usually these women are in a way not very young. Okay, so usually they are in the age period that they are already relative above 35. Mm -hmm. So in which pregnancy in general, okay, is sometimes is faced with some complications in the normal population. So this doesn't help a lot in the sense of uh, to, for a successful breastfeeding. So having a professional help in how to place the baby on the breast and to face that, the, routine, the regular challenges, which, which is in breast cancer survivors are even more, I suppose. How to place the baby on the... This is one the, thing. Uh, the breast that... Either one. Either one. Yeah, right. and the, how to maintain breastfeeding. And uh, this is definitely was a, a success, a key point in successful breastfeeding. If you are not lactating from the breast that was treated, will it affect the volume of milk produced by the remaining breast? Does that breast work double time? Well, actually... For example, women who has who has twins, for example, okay, they usually use one breast for each child. Mm -hmm. And women who has mastectomies, okay, so they remove the, one of the breasts, they can use the other. So I mean, using one breast for exclusive breast feeding is not is something feasible. It's just she needs to know how to deal with it. So, Doctor Azim, I'm I'm gathering that it's not that the if you're only having one breast, it's not that that breast is going to work over time. It's really about the degree of suckling. The more the baby sucks on the breast, the more milk production there is. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Is there going to be a third phase of this study, of the research? Well, actually, yeah. We are very much interested in general in the issues of uh, fertility and survivorship. And uh, at the time being, we don't have... Uh, we are planning some sort of uh, fertility surveys among young breast cancer, breast cancer patients and the challenges they are faced in, uh, in considering getting pregnant. And, uh, and uh, so actually we are planning an extension phase on a larger number of patients, just expanding, not just to breastfeeding, just all the fertility issues in general. Well, I must tell you what I'm so excited about regarding this study is that it, it's really about the future. It's about giving life, the infusion of life. It's, it's about the fact that there's life after breast cancer, and especially if you're a young adult breast cancer survivor, which I happen to be, that there is a vital future, and you need to be cautious, and you need to be educated, but you can get pregnant, and you can still experience motherhood and breastfeeding. So your work is, it's just all about 
survivorship and quality of life and giving life, and I think it's fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, definitely, yeah, I mean, the main, the main thing we would like to promote that we definitely, young women can resume their normal life back to a great extent. And we have moved, I mean, the oncology practice in general have moved from the era of just seeking newer therapies and so on to focusing on as well, um, as well to an, a new, an, another, a, another area, which is how to help patients restore their normal life back as possible. So I hope this uh, work leads to something good for the patients. And where was the study actually conducted? This was conducted in the European Institute of Oncology in Milan. And actually, I was a part of the team a couple of years back, and this this work was done there, and uh, and actually, and even the pregnancy work was done there as well. Well, and Milan happens to be one of the most important centers or the uh, uh, cities in, in the world yeah, that is so breast cancer focused. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we do have. I mean, the I, a lot of a lot of studies was done here, and a lot of practice changing. Uh, attitudes. I mean, and uh, and the practice has been has been done here in Milan, starting with the conservative breast surgery, the uh, one of the adjuvant chemotherapy, the CMF regimen. Yeah, I mean, definitely Milan has contributed big time to the uh, to the uh, successful treatment of breast cancer. Well, this was a joyful interview. Thank you, Dr. Hatim Azam. Azim. Hatim Azim. Dr. Ah, I meant so well. Dr. Azim, well, yeah. Do thank you, Dr. Azim, now based in Brussels, Belgium. Thank you very much. It was Real indeed pleasure. my pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.